Welcome everybody uh, to the latest edition of Chestnut Chat. Um, we are being joined today by uh, David Kaner from Oak Ridge National Laboratories. And he's been invited here by Steve Barilovitz, who is the chair of uh, the science committee with uh, the, the science and technology committee with the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, here in a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to introduce David and our topic for today. Uh, before that, I want to uh, uh, direct you guys to the chat. If you want to tell us something, if you um, have a snarky or fun comment to make, uh, please throw that in the chat. If you have a question, use the Q&A box. And in fact, you have a, if you have a question right now, uh, you can go ahead and throw it in there. Um, people can upvote questions. You can comment on a question. It's a pretty interactive uh, pod. So I hope that you guys will uh, feel compelled to use that. Typically, I hold all the questions until the end. If there is, if you have a real burning question that you really need clarification on, throw it in, um, throw it in the Q&A and I'll interrupt David and, and ask him that. Otherwise, I tend to hold them to the end and uh, uh, moderate the questions that way. If you have an off topic question, I'll probably just answer it in the Q&A box. Um, otherwise, I think here at 11.31, maybe we'll give it to 11.32 after Steve gives the intro, but uh, for that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Kaner and our topic for today. Thanks for coming, everybody. Well, are you, are you ready for me? We're ready for you. Okay. Well, I'm Steve Rilovitz. As has uh, been mentioned, I'm the chair of, the, of, the, of, this, of our Science and Technology Committee. Um, and I met David uh, earlier this year, when we could still travel, uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where... Uh, Several of us from the Chestnut Foundation have gone down there and basically primarily Jared to talk to tell them at, at Oak Ridge what we're doing and sort of and, and what we're doing in Chestnut. And I met da I met David there. He attended that lecture. So, you know, we, we always do quick pro quos on this stuff. Uh, David brought up the subject of, of using GWASH or genomic wide association studies for some of the uh, gene discovery that we have yet not yet completed on five, particularly for Phytophthora. So Anyway, a little bit about him. He received a PhD in, in, in I'm sorry, 2017 from the Australian National University. He's currently a staff scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And I'm just gonna read off of his bio. His PhD involved population scale studying eucalyptus polybractea to expand our understanding of the genetics that affect eucalyptus essential oil yield and quality. And at Oak Ridge National Lab, he's continued to work with forestry genetics and a variety of other species to improve biofuel production traits. That's my introduction. I will say welcome, David, and thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Steve. Um, appreciate the, the intro and I really appreci appreciate the invitation to speak today. Um, I'll share my screen, get, get this set up. Uh, share. I see it. Okay, is that all good? All right, so so really, thank you. I'm quite honored to be here giving a talk to the Chestnut Foundation. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, I, I did my PhD in Australia. Um, I'm Australian. Um, despite being Australian, I'm well aware of the issues facing the American chestnut. Um, we have some, some issues coming now for our um, native eucalyptus populations in Australia with myrtle rust that has come from outside of Australia. And we have a lot of species with very little resistance to it. So, um, you know, so this is an issue that, that is um, very uh, present in my mind. And, um, and so I, I'm very happy to be here to talk about um, the ways that we can use GWAS to find out the genetic basis of traits. Um, and hopefully it's something that will be useful in the, in the battle to bring back the chestnut tree, the native chestnut here in America. So um, without anything further, well, I would like to give you an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. And it's gonna be on a fair number of levels. I'm going being a talk at GWAS 101, and GWAS is an extremely broad um, methodology. And uh, there's a lot involved from phenotyping things out in the field to extracting DNA and sequencing DNA and finding mutations and variants um, in genes that might be affecting traits, uh, statistical modeling. Obviously I can't go into, um, in the time I have, I can't really go into great detail on any of these things, but I'll do my best to explain them um, well enough that 
uh, if, if people want to ask questions and dive a little deeper, then I'm happy to do so, um, assuming we have the time. Uh, so here's sort of an overview of what I'm going to go through. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to read through one to eight there, I'll let you have a, have a quick look. But I'm going to start out by um, discussing what G was, really is for those who, um, especially who a lot of people may not be involved in genetics. Um, so a GWAS, according to the NIH, um, a GWAS is something you use to find out what is the genetic basis of a disease. Now, this is a typical NIH type, um, type definition. Uh, everything must be about humans and everything is about disease. Um, in reality, um, to me, a GWAS is, is finding out the genetic basis of any trait. Um, and the little equation down the bottom, phenotype equals genotype plus environment. I mean, that corresponds to the old, the old saying that, um, you know, nature plus nurture. Um, so what you see in a, in, a, in a trait is subject, the, the variation you see in a trait, so the variation you see in a phenotype is subject to the variation in genetics and the variation in environment. And with the GWAS, what we really wanna do is try and figure out the variation in the genotype, in the genetics, um, while minimizing the variation in the environment, because it's the variation genetics that we are interested in from a GWAS perspective. And it's called GWAS, it's genome-wide, because what we want to find is the variation in genetics across the entire genome of the species, and see, rather than focusing just on a few specific genes or a few specific regions of the genome. GWAS is already very commonly used in trees. Here's a few, um, a few recently published papers in the last couple of few years on um, various species. And in particular, these are GWAS for pathogens, um, pathogen resistance. So it's a, it's a real go-to method for trying to understand what are the genes and mutations that seem to be um, conferring varying amounts of resistance in a population to different pathogens. Of course, you can use it for any trait. Um, we can do GWAS for all sorts of wood properties in trees and, and regularly do. Um, and again, from a, from a review paper, you can see it's a very active, um, very active methodology. Some of the things that vary, yeah, can I just ask, is my mouse visible to people? Yes. Yes. Okay, visible. great. So you can see there's variation in how big a sample size is used in, a, in different GWAS, different, different um, statistical methods, different types of markers. These are the, the mutational markers that are discovered. And all of this is part of the variety um, involved in GWAS. And this is one of the reasons why I won't have time to go into, into great depth because there's so much variation in how GWAS is done. But I'll try and explain the general gist of all of this and why you might choose um, different sample sizes and um, different uh, modeling methods. So essentially you can GWAS virtually anything. You can, um, you can, anything you can measure in a population that varies can be subject to a GWAS to see if there, if there is a genetic basis and um, to try and narrow that down to which parts of the genome are associating with that variation in the phenotype. Um, even down to the bottom one here, which is gene expression. So if you were to measure the, um, if you were to run uh, something such as RNA-seq in a population and measure the expression of all the genes in the genome, each gene and its expression and the way that expression varies in the population can become a phenotype. So you can basically measure anything and try and find the genetic basis of anything. And in, in humans, um, People even look for, Run GWAS is looking for the reasons for, say, um, addiction to cigarettes or um, behavioral traits, things that you wouldn't initially necessarily consider to be um, genetic, but it sometimes appears that uh, there is a genetic, partly a genetic basis to some of these behavioral traits. In trees, obviously, we don't have so much behavioral traits, but we, um, there's certainly no limit on the things we can measure. The key to all of it is phenotypic variation. If you don't have any variation, and down in the bottom right, I have this picture of, um, 
of a plantation. I think those are um, actually species of eucalypt. And they're all clonal. These are basically, there's no genetic variation in this plot. They're all genetic clones and they're all grown in one sort of microclimate. So there's very little environmental variation going here. And you can see they're all pretty much phenotypically very, very similar to each other. If there is very little variation, then we, we don't have much material for running a GWAS. What we want is to be able to measure the variation. And so, and, and we may, it may be simple variation that may be caused by one gene, such as a Mendelian trait, the, the color of these pea flowers, or it may be something that's caused by probably many genes and many locations within the genome. Uh, such as the shape of um, white oak leaves. And you can see how widely these white oaks vary. What is causing that? Is it, is it genetics? Is it environment? Does a white oak growing in um, one place where it gets more rainfall grow leaves differently to a white oak in another place with, with a different amount of rainfall? Well, that's, again, the point of G was, is to try and pull those two things apart and look at the G rather than the E. And if we can minimize the environmental variation that makes our um, our job much easier in finding the genetic variation. Just briefly, for those who may not have a background in genetics and, um, and biology, um, when I'm talking about genetic variation, um, in the simplest case, what I'm talking about is how certain locations within the genome um, may vary amongst individuals in a population. So if we're talking about diploid organisms, such as humans or most, of, most tree species, um, we have two copies of every chromosome, which means we get one from our mom, one from our dad. And most of the space in those chromosomes is the same. But every now and then we find certain locations where what we got from our mother might be different from what we got from our father. So that's represented by the green and the blue here. And these are alleles. And so any individual in a population if you look at that spot in their genome, they're either going to have two copies of green, two copies of blue, or one green and one blue. And that differences, those, those differences in the alleles may or may not affect the phenotype that you're interested in. In fact, if there are millions of locations in the genome that vary like this, chances are that most of them don't affect the phenotype that you are specifically interested in, but some may. We just don't know which ones do and which ones don't. But what we can then do is we can now look at, look at the entire population and look at that spot in the genome. And we can say, okay, all individuals that have two greens, how, how tall do they grow? What's, their, what's their, the height of these trees, the ones with the two greens? And if we find that they're generally relatively short and the individuals that have one green and one blue are taller in general, and the individuals that have two blue alleles at this site are the tallest yet, we start to see a relationship, we start to see a trend. And that trend is what we're looking for in a GWAS. We start to infer the fact that there is an allelic effect going on here. The more copies of the blue allele you add to an individual, the taller the tree gets. And this is the cornerstone of GWAS. So if we look at the types of traits out there, if you're talking about a simple trait where you might have one allele, the green and the blue that, that are affecting that trait, and you can divide the population into three classes very easily, uh, that will produce a, a distribution of the phenotype that looks something like this. So you have three different points in the phenotype. If we were talking about tree height, for example, um, you have three groups of the uh, subgroups of the population, and they, they distribute around three, um, three central points. And that distribution is probably, it would be due to environmental effects, but you can see three major genetic, um, genetic effects going on. But what happens when we start to get, look at more complex traits such as um, tree height or, or uh, disease resistance, things that are not necessarily down to one gene or one location in the genome? Well, when we start to take multiple complex, um, multiple variants, multiple sites in the gene, mutation sites in the genome that affect a trait, they all start to add up. They all start to affect things together. And this is called an additive effect. And what it produces is a more continuous and more consistent distribution of the phenotype. And this is typical of a complex trait. And so the problem we have in the real world 
is that what you see here, this is the theory, but what we see in reality is the black line. We see that distribution and we don't know what is going on to produce that distribution. We don't know how many locations in the genome are having an effect on the trait. We don't know which ones. We don't know how big their effect is. It's a mystery. That's why we want to do a GWAS. We want to discover what are the subcomponents? What are the things that cause this black line, that cause this distribution when we measure a phenotype in a population? So GWAS is our go-to tool for doing so. Um, we can't, we don't have the high throughput ability to genetically knock out or knock in use, um, every gene in the genome combinatorically to try and figure it out using engineering techniques. So GWAS is a statistical technique that lets us do this. And it gives us an approximation of the truth of what is going on under that curve. And so this is just a summary of that question. Rather than looking at one spot in the genome, we look genome wide. We can see that there are multiple locations that have multiple alleles. And then we can try and answer the question, which ones have an effect on the trait? And the answer hopefully will be to do a GWAS. So here's a little bit about how, how we go and do a GWAS. If we're talking about a quantitative trait, you know, one that typically has a continuous distribution, we wanna take an unrelated, a relatively unrelated pop, um, population of, of trees. We wanna measure a phenotype such as height and we can plot that distribution. Then we want to um, sequence the DNA of our entire population and look for the positions in the genome that, are, that have mutations that basically vary. Most of the positions in the genome don't vary at all. But typically in a, um, in a population of trees, for example, in the eucalyptus population I worked in with my, um, my PhD, I ended up working with over 2 million uh, locations in the genome that were, that were variable. So 2 million single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so in this little diagram here, I'm just focusing on one of them. And uh, there are two alleles, orange and black. I'm sorry, I moved away from green and blue. I've just noticed. But um, nevertheless, here's an example of one SNP in a population of M individuals. So we measured all of their, um, basically their DNA and um, their genetic variation. And then we apply what I described before, we, we look at the way, we look for a correlation between the genetic variation and the phenotypic variation. And if you can see, when you split the population into these three allelic groups, if you can see this trend line here, um, the line that's fit with a linear model, and it's a very simple linear model in this case, but if that line has a slope that is greater than zero, and the zero slope line is, is, is shown here in, um, with a dashed horizontal line through the mean of the population, the mean height in this case. But you can see the line that we've fit has a slope greater than zero. And that indicates to us that this SNP has an effect on height. The amount of the slope starts to give us um, some indication of the significance of this SNP with respect to height. Also the amount of individuals, the population size and the way they are split amongst these three different classes also affects the ability to determine if a SNP is truly significant for height. But nevertheless, that's, that's the gist. This is GWAS right here, o overly simplified. But if you understand what is going on here, then you understand the basics of GWAS. Of course, there are certain traits that don't fit the whole um, continuous distribution uh, sometimes we're interested in binary traits, such as whether a tree is susceptible or resistant to a pathogen. So in this kind of GWAS, we will take our population, we'll split them into susceptible and resistant. We might know that by having performed inoculation studies. We do the same stage of sequencing and finding the variant uh, genetic sites. And then what we look for at any given SNP we look to see if the percentage, um, if the frequency, for example, of the orange allele at this SNP is greater in one group than it is in the other. The expectation is that, um, that if you split these 
trees and there was no effect of this SNP, it, that, that orange allele would be split approximately 50-50 in the two groups. But in this example, we see that there is 60% um, in the resistant group have the orange allele, while only 36% have the orange allele in the susceptible group. And so you can start to infer that perhaps this orange allele, so perhaps SNP1 that has this orange allele is having an effect on the amount on the on whether a tree is resistant or susceptible to this pathogen. Once again, a very um, once again a very um, high level overview, but nevertheless, this is the cornerstone of GWAS for binary traits. So the three main steps: are phenotyping, genotyping, and then running your model. And I'm going to talk about um, each of these stages now in, by using a case study from my PhD using. Um, the eucalyptus GWAS that I, that I performed. And I'll talk about some of the issues that, um, that need to be addressed at each of these stages at one, two, and three. And then how we go about once we have run our GWAS, how, how um, we can then interpret the results so we have something useful. So the GWAS that I ran in my PhD was for oil traits in eucalyptus polybractea. Eucalyptus polybracter is this bushy little tree here shown on the left. Um, it's a mallee. It, um, it, it, it grows quite rapidly and accumulates a lot of essential oil in its leaves, enough that you can extract it and, um, and make a, um, a product out of it, uh, which is shown on the right here. Everyone's probably heard of eucalyptus oil. It can also be used as a really high powered jet fuel. Um, there's potentially a future as a biofuel there. Um, so it's important that we start to understand what the genetics of how this oil is produced and why it varies a lot. If you take a, um, if you take two eucalyptus polybractea plants growing even just next to each other, one of them probably has a lot more oil in its leaves than the one next to it. And the profile of the chemicals in that oil often changes quite dramatically from tree to tree. So if we're gonna discover what are the genes that are causing that variation in the phenotype, we, we decided to work with, um, with a plantation that already existed uh, for commercial purposes out in a place called West Wyalong in the middle of nowhere in New South Wales, Australia. And so here's a photo from on the ground. These trees grow uh, up to a height of about two meters, then they are chopped down, they are coppiced mulched up and harvested for their oil and they regrow and every two or so years you can reharvest them. Well, we chose 480 trees from within this plantation and we would pick leaves directly off the trees, trying to pick leaves at a similar age, extract the oils from within the leaves using ethanol, then run them through um, a metabolomics assay, which I believe a talk was given not too long ago on, on that process, on how to... Um, discover what are the metabolites in, in a plant. Well, very briefly, it, it, the extracted oil is put through this GCMS machine, which separates the constituents of the oil out and, um, and then fires them at a mass spectrometer. And what you get is this um, chromatogram where each peak represents a different constituent of the oil. So these are basically different types of molecule and we can um, use some special software to try and figure out what each peak represents, which type of molecule. <clears throat> and we can also um, determine the abundance of each of these peaks. And that gives us at the end of the day, if we do this for every sample or 480 of the trees that we sampled, we end up with this matrix of metabolites. Each metabolite is a column and each sample is a row. And so each metabolite is essentially one phenotype that has been measured across all the samples of our population. Some of the metabolites are more abundant than others. Some of them are more interesting to us than others. In my PhD, we discovered, we found about a hundred metabolites in our population. We were explicitly looking for secondary metabolites. These are the metabolites that make up the oil. And we were interested in particular in about 10 of them. Here's a, um, a view of the distribution of, of five of the most interesting metabolites for us. This one up in the top left is called cineol. It's the dominant metabolite in eucalyptus oil. Um, and you can see how the distributions in our population, how they vary 
you look down the diagonal here, and that's that phenotypic variation that is uh, that is um, the purpose of the of the GWAS. This is what we are trying to explain by figuring out what is caused by genetics, what is caused by environment, and which part of the genetics, which genes. Before I move on to the genetic side of things, um, I want to talk a bit about the phenotyping and the, um, the pitfalls of it, because I mentioned before that we are trying to minimize environmental variance so we can focus on the genetic variance. If we look at the field site, this is, this is the Google Earth image of our field site. If we were to choose our 480 trees from area one, notice how the growth of these trees varies enormously in that section. It's probably because it undulates. There's, there's hilliness, uh, little valleys, water probably pools in some areas and not in others, which means that any variation we find in the eucalyptus oil between the different plants, it's going to be hard to determine. Is that due to the, the location and the, of where they were in the field or is it due to the differences in their genetics? It's gonna make our life hard when we run a GWAS. So we ensured that we sampled the trees from area two here where the growth is clearly much more consistent. Environmental variation is probably reduced and therefore any variation we find in the oils between the trees is likely due to genetics. And so our results that we get are, are less, less likely to be full of false positives. Down here, I circled in red, a little um, white vehicle. It turned out when I was looking at the field site from on Google Earth, and I looked at the date here um, in 2015, I realized that was a day my, myself and, my, and our team were actually out in the field doing sampling. And so we've captured for all time the fact that we were out there doing a GWAS, and it's, uh, it's captured for posterity in Google Earth. Um, we are probably tiny dots somewhere in this field, but the resolution's qu not quite high enough, which is a shame. Nevertheless, it was pretty fun to, um, to find our car. So when it comes to phenotyping for GWAS, we wanna minimize the environmental variance. We wanna also make sure that when we perform assays like GCMS, that we run randomization. We, they, there are effects when you run 480 samples on a GCMS machine in a row, some of the things that are run earlier will have shifted results or slightly different results to those run later. So we want to randomize the things that we grabbed from the field. I learned this the hard way. I didn't randomize it initially and I had to make some um, mathematical adjustments to try and account for these shifts and batch effects. So um, this was a typical PhD student error and, um, and it's worth mentioning it now. Randomizing things as much as possible um, avoids erroneous trends in the data. Accuracy of your phenotyping is massively important. Any errors you make in phenotyping mean that the results that you find out of your GWAS are less likely to be true. You can imagine if you completely randomized your phenotype, in other words, it's entirely erroneous, and you ran a GWAS, there's still a chance that you would find, statistically, you would find associations between genes and that erroneous phenotype. And, and so this tells you that the more accurate you make your phenotype, the better your results are likely to be. Garbage in, garbage out. It's, a, it's an old saying, but it's a good one. And it really does apply in this, in this scenario. And consistency, which I talked about before, um, you, want to, you want to make sure that when you measure things, for example, we measured leaves and we made sure that they were um, generally the same age if you measured leaves and the oil in leaves from different ages, then the variation you're getting is not necessarily due to genetics. It could be just due to the age of the leaves. So you want to make sure your sampling is consistent across your population. On the genotyping side of things, we again, we sampled leaves. We froze them in liquid nitrogen in the field, took them back to the lab, extracted the DNA from each leaf, from each sample and put it through sequencing then a, pipeline, a bioinformatics pipeline to find all those variants, those spots in the genome that differ from, um, from each other and form up what we call a genotype matrix. So again, just like we did with our metabolite matrix here, we, instead of being metabolites, it's SNPs, it's single nucleotide polymorphisms within the genome that vary. And we have, um, in my case, we had 2.3 million of these SNPs. 
So this was a pretty big matrix and we had 480 samples. Now I'm really glossing over how this is done. I will show one quick slide um, on this, um, but really I could spend probably three or four hours going into the intricacies of this if I had the time. But basically, if we look at two samples out of our 480, we'll call it the blue and the red sample. We take the DNA and we fragment it into thousands, in fact, millions of small pieces. These fragments then get sequenced on, on a sequencing machine, such as an Illumina machine. And what you end up with is a, a data files full of what are called fast Q reads. Each of these reads is a digital representation of these fragments. There will be some error in there, but also um, hopefully they will generally be pretty accurate, but we have no idea where each fragment actually came from within the original chromosomes that we put onto the machine. So what we do is we take a reference genome, which is a genome assembly for our species, or if we don't have one for our species, we take one from a closely related species. In my case, there was no genome assembled for Eucalyptus polybractea. So I use the Eucalyptus grandis genome as my reference. And they're, they're closely related trees. So the genetics are generally pretty close to each other. We align all of these fragments the best we can using, um, using software to the reference genome. And we do that for each sample separately. And then we look for the places um, where, where we find differences, where we find what looks like an error compared in the alignment compared to the reference. And then you can see here, if the reference at this spot is, is orange, which represents say an A nucleotide, the blue sample has a mix of, mix of oranges and blacks, while the red sample has just orange. So what we infer from that is that the blue sample is a heterozygote. It has two different alleles at this site, while the red sample is a homozygote for the, for, for the same allele as the reference. It's A slash A versus in this case for the blue A slash G. And this is how we do genotyping. Immediately you can see though, the red sample has what we call lower depth than the blue sample. It has less available material. We, I, I try, it's a little subtle, but I, I showed there were fewer fragments in the red sample being sequenced than there were in the blue sample, which means we get less data for the red than we do for the blue. And even though we can see only three orange, um, three, three orange pieces of data, three evidence for th three pieces of evidence that the the red sample is has got the A allele, we still then having to make a guess that its genotype is A slash A because we don't have. You can imagine if we'd sequenced a lot more data from the red sample, we might eventually find some black alleles. So the, the problem with the red sample is we've got very little data and our genotyping process involves some guesswork, which means it's probably less accurate than the blue sample where we have a lot more data to use for inference. Again, that's, I could spend hours on the issues around this, but this goes to the, the fact that sampling depth and um, sequencing depth are a key aspect of GWAS. So if you have a budget to run a GWAS, typically you have a fixed budget. And the question becomes, should I spend more of my money on ensuring that I have adequate high depth of sequencing for each of my samples? Or should I stick with a low amount of depth per sample and do more samples? It's a very important decision to make and it's a tough one. If you sequence less samples, like on the left, you can get higher, accu higher accuracy in your genotyping as I just showed, but then you have reduced statistical power when it comes, to figure, comes down to figuring out which SNPs are actually significant. When I talked about that, that um, trend line being drawn and figuring out whether that trend is significant, what matters very much is the size of your population. So the other option is to do say twice as, twice as many um, plants in your population but you're going to have to reduce the amount of sequencing you do per plant, given your budget. We're going to end up with higher statistical power, but we are going to have a less reliable um, accuracy in our genotyping. So there is no hard and fast answer here. I tend personally to lean towards the right, the scenario on the right. I found in my thesis that I actually had lower depth 
than would have been preferable, but I still managed using some clever bioinformatic techniques to maximize the accuracy despite the low depth. And having more samples meant that I was able to find statistically significant genes or SNPs and genes relating to various oil traits that I probably wouldn't have found if I'd gone for higher depth and less accessions. So the third stage is doing the actual modeling. We have our, in my case, I have my metabolite matrix. I have my genotype matrix. And to do, to, we need to actually translate this genotype matrix into a system of zeros, ones, and twos. What these are is a count of the minor allele. So if SNP1 has two alleles at this site, it has A's or C's. Most of the samples in our population, according to this example, have two copies of the A allele, which is the major allele. And this sample here, sample two has one copy of C. And so you can see that translates to most of the population being zero. They have no copies of C, except for sample two, which has one copy. And we do that for each SNP. Um, sometimes certain samples have two copies of an alternate allele. And so we number every cell in this matrix as a zero, a one, or a two. Once we have that, and this is basically telling you the class that each sample falls into for each SNP. Once we have that, we can then start to filter out certain SNPs. So SNP one, it turns out, is what you'd call a rare SNP. Um, there's very few samples that actually have any variation going here. Um, because the variation is so small, it's not very useful for us in our GWAS. We won't have much statistical power with it, so we get rid of it. We keep the SNPs that are useful. Um, there's a lot more stages to filtering than I'm letting on here, but uh, that's again for another talk entirely. Once we have our filtered down SNP set, we can then start to model each SNP in turn. So we put them into this linear, simple linear model here. Each phenotype becomes a Y vector. Each SNP becomes an X vector. And what we're trying to estimate is B or beta. And that is the effect size of the SNP. While E is error or environmental, usually environmental variance. And if we fit this model, what we come out with is a P value. And when we do that for 2.3 million SNPs, as I did in my PhD, we end up with 2.3 million p-values, one for each SNP. So these data sets can get pretty big, pretty rapidly. This lit simple linear model has a problem though. You can imagine that if we sample our trees and it turns out that they are actually, they have underlying population structure. There are subgroups of trees that are closely related to each other. Um, as shown by this sort of family tree phy phylogeny here. What we are trying to do in our GWAS is correlate SNPs to phenotype. Oops, I've skipped ahead. Is correlate SNPs to phenotype. But what we may be seeing when we get a p-value that looks significant for, for a given SNP, what we might actually be seeing is an indirect correlation where a SNP and the variation that SNP might actually correlate to the variation in the population structure, which in turn might correlate to the phenotype. So an example might be in people where if you were to do a GWAS for hair color, to understand that why some people are blonde and some people have black hair, and you sampled people from Sweden and from Africa. Well, there are many genetic differences between people from Sweden, native people from Sweden and native people from Africa. There is also clearly a phenotypic difference between hair color on average between people in Sweden and people in Africa. Now, there might be some genes that cause that difference in hair color, but there are also a lot of genes and SNPs that are just generally causing differences between people from Sweden and people from Africa. And what you're going to find is that every one of those SNPs that underpins the general genetic difference between people from Sweden and people from Africa is gonna turn out to be associating with hair color. So these are what's called false positive associations. So how do we deal with this? Firstly, it pays not to sample, to do your sampling with substructure. If you were to do a study of hair, hair color like that, it's best not to go and sample a bunch from Sweden and a bunch from Africa. Nevertheless, sometimes in trees, it's hard to know who is related to who, it's not so obvious. So what we do is we implement 
uh, this term called K or kinship, where um, we model the relationships between all our individuals in our population with respect to each other. And we make sure that, that the relatedness between individuals, that population structure is accounted for in our model. And that's called the K term. And, and I won't go into the maths of how that's done, but once we've accounted for that, we can reduce the false positive associations that we're likely to get. And so here's what results look like after we've run a GWAS. This is the results I got for one class of secondary metabolites called sesquiterpenes. This is called a Manhattan plot. Every on the x-axis are positions in the genome across all the chromosomes. There are 11 chromosomes in eucalyptus. And on the y-axis is basically the negative log transform of the p-value for each, the p-values that we get for each SNP. So the higher a position, the higher a dot, every dot here is a SNP and its p-value. The higher a dot is on the plot, the more significant that SNP was in associating with sesquiterpenes. So I've circled two up here, which were the highest. These were the most significant. Now I have 2.3 million dots on this plot. What tells us whether a SNP is significant or not? At what threshold? Now, if this isn't like a small scale experiment where we can say, oh, if P is less than 0.05, let's call that significant. The reason we can't do that is we've run 2.3 million tests. We have what's called a multiple testing problem. Just by random chance, when you run 2.3 million statistical tests, a lot of them will turn out to be significant by random chance. So what we do is we do an adjustment and that's what the red line here represents, a threshold. And it, and it means that anything that makes it above that red line is considered statistically significant. Everything below it, not so much. That doesn't mean that the things below it are false positives. It just means the chances of them being false positives is greater. And the further down you go, um, the less significant you get and you start to ignore the things down here. So when we look at, uh, I, I mentioned that I was interested in about 10 different um, traits, 10 different metabolites. So here are several Manhattan plots for the different, for five, five different traits here. And we can start to point out the, um, the various SNPs that are making it above our threshold and look at what are the genes in the genome that these, uh, these significant SNPs might be sitting in or near. And I've highlighted some of those, and in particular here in red, for two of the most important um, metabolites in eucalyptus oil, 1,8-cineol and alpha-pinene. We can then take this set of SNPs that are clearly significant for alpha-pinene, and we can zoom in on this area in the first chromosome of eucalyptus. We can see that there are if here is that stack of significant SNPs zoomed in, and here is a track showing the annotations of genes, and there's a whole series of what are called TPS genes. These are terpene synthase genes. These are exactly the sort of genes we would expect to find because they produce, these are the genes that are known to produce secondary metabolites that go into essential oils. And so we were very pleased to find this. this. This is an indication that our GWAS is working. It tells us we can't be sure exactly which of these genes are producing alpha-pinene, however, but we can say these become candidate genes. They're candidate genes for explaining the variation in our population of alpha-pinene. Um, we actually then followed up from here and we took these genes, synthesized them and put them into E. coli and found that indeed those genes when placed into E. coli produced alpha-pinene. So the GWAS was successful. We were able to find specific genes in the eucalyptus polybractia genome that we hypothesized are affecting the variation of alpha-pinene. And we were able to prove that indeed those genes do produce alpha-pinene. And that, that is um, in, in a sense, the gold standard of GWAS. That's what we're trying to do with the GWAS right there. You, you can end a GWAS there that we, we have run validation. You could also run a GWAS in an individual, uh, in a separate population and try to recover exactly the same result. If you don't validate your GWAS results, um, all you have really is a hypothesis. You have candidates. So validation is very important. 
multi-omics integration, this is a step that I'm doing a lot of at ORNL where we take the results, such as the, the green dots here would be candidate genes. In this case, these are Poplar, an example from Poplar. And we take other omic information, such as expression data, transcriptomics, we could take proteomics, metabolomics, and integrate all of this data together to try and tell a broader systems biology story that lets us um, discover more about what these genes are doing in the full system of the plant. We can try other statistical models. The results we got in our GWAS show one thing, but if we run other, there are other ways to run a GWAS statistically, and we might find that certain SNPs that were not significant in one GWAS become significant in another. And overall, the goal is to build the story, build hypotheses, validate them, and figure out what is the genetic basis of our trait. And so I'm going to leave it on, leave it there on that. Uh, this is quite a whirlwind tour of, um, of GWAS. Um, I hope it was informative and I'd, I'd be very happy to answer questions and dive deeper into any of these aspects. And here I'd like to thank a few of the key people who were involved in the eucalyptus GWAS, who were involved in, um, in uh, GWAS with Poplar and working, I uh, work with um, in Daniel Jacobson's lab at ORNL. Um, we're doing some, some really interesting um, approaches to GWAS and multi-omics integration. Jerry Tuscan, who's the head of CBI, um, and there'd be probably another 50 people I would have to name if I were to name everyone involved in gathering all the traits and genetics together for eucalyptus and poplar. So I don't have the room to list them all. And I'd like to thank all of the, all of the logos here uh, that represent various sources of funding and supercomputing facilities. Because one thing that GWAS does is it generates a lot of data. The process of genotyping and phenotyping produces a lot of data and you often need a fair bit of computational power to process it all. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that was informative. Thanks so much, David. Absolutely. Can I say that that was a fair dinkum presentation? Am I allowed to say that? You can. Um, okay. I'd, I'd like to hear you say it with an Australian accent. but um, fair, fair dinkum. Fair dinkum. Very nice. <laughs> all right. Sweet. <laughs> uh, we, our family watches too much Bluey, so <laughs> it, it, it kind of rubs off on me <laughs> and the kids. Um, well, thank, I'm curious. So you said this generates a lot of data. Like, what kind, of, what kind of storage are you guys looking at for like a single project? I mean, terabytes or more? Yeah, so the biggest part of the data is the sequencing data. You, you send your DNA for each. So I had almost 500 samples, which in GWAS terms is not that big. And each of those got sequenced and each of them returned uh, gigabytes of data in FASTQ format. In total, I had 1.3 terabases of sequencing which translated into about one and a half terabytes of data. Bigger GWASs will have significantly more than that. And also I should mention the eucalyptus genome is not that big. If you were to do 500 um, pine trees, loblolly pine trees at 22 gigabases per genome, that's about 40 times the size of the eucalyptus genome, you would have 40 times the amount of data. Yeah, and conifers tend to have much bigger genomes anyway. Is that, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so the amount of data, the amount of processing comes down to the size of the genome, how much sequencing you do. I talked about sequencing depth. If you do shallow sequencing of the type I did, I ended up with about one terabyte um, for 500 or so plants. But if I'd done more in-depth sequencing and paid more, I would have had multiples of the multiples the size of data. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to think about how, <laughs> how complex that is. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, I do have a few questions. Uh, Bruce Levine, who um, is a, a doctoral student in plant pathology at the University of Maryland, he's, he wants to point out, uh, he said, we should stress for the audience that not all pathogen resistance is a binary trait and resistance to Cryphonectria parasitica is not. Can, can you address that at all? And maybe yes. draw some parallels? So, so in, in the, the example I gave was a binary trait of, oh, look, these trees are susceptible and these are resistant. In truth, when you inoculate a population of say, um, in a greenhouse, or whatever, with a pathogen, you often find a whole continuous scale of resistance um, or susceptibility. So often with a rust, you'll find a certain amount of spotting on the leaf 
um, which can go from almost nothing to entirely covered. And you can then measure that with a, as a continuous trait. And so you can absolutely do a GWAS of a continuous trait of resistance and susceptibility. You can divide it into classes, low, medium, high, very high resistance. So yeah, um, Bruce is absolutely correct. Okay. And then uh, another, uh, Matthew Marr asked, he said, what is the distribution in the chestnuts of the res resistance trait? And I, you know, that's pretty similar. It goes from um, highly susceptible to highly resistant and, and everything in between. You see the full spectrum of, of resistance. And so that it's definitely not binary. <laughs> and and um, Right. And so you would want to use a continuous trait GWAS to analyze the results of that. You can binarize it by taking extremes. You can take the extremely not resistant and the extremely resistant into two groups. Um, I'm not sure whether that is a good idea or not. So I'm, I'm just saying it can be done, but not whether it's a good idea to do. Well, and that's interesting. So, so Paul um, uh, asked a question a little while ago. He said, if you have, I think I understand what he's asking. He says, if you have 10 highly surviving, like wild type Americans that, that looks to have resistant and they're surviving with the blight, and then 10 trees which die real, super susceptible, can you find the difference and change those genes from a plus to a minus? That, that's um, how the question is written. Potentially. So if you can find the genes that are underpinning that difference, you then, it, it, the effect might be due to, if you're looking at SNPs as your variants, the effect might be due to a SNP in a gene that is changing the protein that that gene produces, for example. That's one, one mechanism that might be causing the effect. Um, and then if you are able to CRISPR that gene and edit that SNP, then yes, it, it might not be due to a SNP in a gene. The SNP might be sitting outside a gene in a promoter region, which affects the transcription of the gene. So it might be that you, uh, you are needing to edit the way that gene is expressed. And then it might not be a SNP at all. It could be a structural variant. It could be that a section of a gene is deleted or inserted. So depending on what you discover, what type of variants you use in your GWAS, SNPs, structural variants, the, the downstream aspect is, is difficult. That's where that multi-omic stage comes in, zooming in on the position of the SNP or variant in the genome, a lot further analysis. Once you do hopefully discover what is going on, then if, if genetic engineering is on the table, the idea is yes, is to try and, um, to try and engineer things or bring genes that confer resistance in from from another species into your species. Right, right. right. Doug McLean asks, he said, our resistance in just the nut species is binary. In other words, in non-hybrid chestnuts, all pure Americans are susceptible. I'm not quite sure what Doug's getting at. I know um, virtually all wild type Americans are susceptible. There are a few, and, and that's putative though. Like I. The American chestnuts that we've found with resistance, like I'm going to name a few, the Ort tree, the Adair County tree, the, the Adair County tree, the, or I'm um, sorry, the Amherst County tree, these trees um, are in a current uh, landscape genomics trial and also a ancestry informative marker trial to try and figure out if they are uh, really American chestnuts, um, but they have moderate resistance. So, you know, in the American chestnut, it's not resistant or not, it's somewhat resistant and not resistant um, and, and then everything in between, but it doesn't go up to that high resistance that you see in the, right. the uh, Asiatic so, species. So there is likely to be a range of genetic lo loci within the genome that is a f conferring at least some resistance. And a GWAS can be used to try and find those locations. It doesn't matter if you have in full on resistance or not, as long as there's variation. All that matters is that there is some variation in your phenotype. Um, the question I asked when Steve um, was, when I met with Steve back at o Oak Ridge National Lab before coronavirus hit was, is, has, is there variation in resistance in the Chinese chestnuts? And has a GWAS been run in the Chinese chestnut species? I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I do, are you aware of of this? 
I'm not aware of that, Steve. Are you? I I I I know of no such study. So yeah, because there you have, from what I understand, you have pretty much a com complete resistance in various individuals. And so you may be able to find if the genetics, I assume, again, I'm making assumptions, chestnut is not a tree I know all that much about genetically. The, the genomes of the Chinese chestnut and the American chestnut are actually probably pretty similar. Um, they are very probably similar. Quite closely related. Yep. What you discover in the Chinese chestnut may be transferable to the American chestnut. Um, but, and so a GWAS in the Chinese chestnut may have more chance of turning up the genetics of resistance to the blight than doing it in the American, partly because you do need a lot of individuals. You need a broad population and you want a genetically diverse population for your GWAS analysis. If you're, um, it, I, I don't know how difficult it would be to do in the American chestnut to get hundreds and hundreds of genetically distinct individuals who sit on the resistance continuum that would be very difficult because there, there there are maybe like 20 americans that actually have any sort of discernible resistance so, and the rest would, of yeah, so that, my assumption was and that was why i asked the question back in that meeting was has this been done in the chinese chestnut where you'd have no trouble i assume getting a good population together what's called a gwas diversity population and then executing the three steps that i talked about in the presentation and so Bruce, uh, who, who asked a, one of the first questions, he says he doesn't think it's been done in China. He's, he's traveled. He spent a lot of time in China and has studied it over there. And he said people in China are planning to do it, but it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to have been done. Yeah. And so if it was if there was a plan to do it, um, you know, what I've presented here is a very high level overview. There is a lot of experimental planning that goes into it um, and would be, of course, happy to to consult on that side of things. Um, there are a lot of people around who are, have a lot of expertise in GWAS. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's something that it would be very interesting to see what are, the, what are the genetics of that resistance. There are certain types of genes, classes of genes that we would expect to turn up, such as the NBSLRR type genes um, that are known to be involved in pathogen resistance um, and we would, we would advocate for a multi-omics um, type approach. So not just to extract DNA and find SNPs and run a GWAS, but also to sequence um, RNA-seq to get expression data. These become what's called line of evidence, lines of evidence. You know, you can then start to build up your hypothesis and make it um, far more rigid, far more significant if you have multiple lines of evidence from different omic layers and that's that's really what what we're planning on doing and or are or, or in the process of doing yeah especially the rna seq um we have a lot of questions are you able to stick around for maybe 15 20 more minutes let's do it <laughs> yeah, okay all right um uh, i'm pretty sure this is debbie um would it have been better or easier to have had a reference genome from your species instead of a related species or was this not much of a problem it's a great question Short answer, yes, it would have been better. Um, the alignment of those DNA fragments, the sequenced DNA fragments to the reference genome worked. But what I found was that I only managed to cover about 70% of the eucalyptus grandis genome with reads. What was probably happening is there are broad sections of eucalyptus grandis that don't exist in eucalyptus polybractea and vice versa. And so anything like that, nothing will align there. Um, also, where things did align, there are often enough, a lot of SNPs in a short space because there are a reasonable number of differences between the species from a good 10 million years of, of um, evolutionary separation. And that meant that often an, a, a fragment that was aligning would have multiple uh, differences to the reference and the aligner would score that, it would score that as a low quality alignment, um, which it was, it was making a guess. It was saying, oh, I could align this here. I could align it there. There's, there's lots of errors. 
And so it becomes harder to trust the alignment when it's like that, which becomes harder to trust the calling of the variants and the genotyping. Everything compounds and it means that your downstream data becomes less reliable and you're faced with false positives. So absolutely, if you have your own species reference, always a better thing. Yeah. Um, so Mike Alcott asks, can your modeling procedures separate out the possible influences of one gene on another? For example, a given gene might not influence a trait unless another apparently unrelated gene is expressed. Another great question. That's called epistasis, uh, where, say, two genes together have a, com a joint effect, whereas on their own, they may not appear to have any effect. That's often something like a protein complex so two, um, two proteins might not do anything to affect your trait until they join together and, and do their thing. We, have, we are working with techniques, um, what are called nonlinear um, modeling techniques, such as random forest, iterative random forest, where you fit the model to determine what are the SNPs that, and genes that are important for the trait. And then this is a, using a decision tree system and I won't go into the maths, but it, it lets us explore these decision trees and find pathways through them that link SNPs to each other. And that can tell us if two SNPs have a greater effect together than they would on their own. And so it's a detection method for epistasis. Computationally detecting those joint relationships is really um, heavy work. You can imagine if you had to model, if you had 2 million SNPs and you had to model the combinations of every pair of SNPs. And then what about three SNPs working together or four? The combinatorics gets ridiculous. The computing power is not there, even with the world's biggest supercomputer like Summit. So we use clever like sort of approximation techniques like random forest to try and get it exactly that. And we found, we find relationships. There are some very well-known ones um, in certain traits. I think flower, in flowering time in Arabidopsis, maybe there is a very well-known epistatic interaction and and so yeah it's an important thing to do in a broader GWAS type study is to look for those relationships okay uh bruce levine again ask uh so in our program in the uh, the program with american chestnuts and restoration we have whole populations that are at least distantly related for example all clapper trees is the source of resistance we have our third or fourth cousins of each other and of themselves how do we deal with that that's okay um in fact, third and fourth cousins, while they are related, the coefficient of kinship between them is relatively low. Um, how do we deal with it? If you recall, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yes. Yes. If you recall yeah. here, I had this K term in the model. Now, this is a gross simplification of what that is. It stands for kinship. On that heat map is pairwise kinship between each individual in the population. The darker red means they're more related to each other and they start clustering together. Um, this is basically the equivalent of what's called a covariance matrix. It tells you how, if two individuals co-vary genetically, they probably co-vary phenotypically as well. You know, I am closely related to my brother, we're probably similar in height more similar you could guess my height if you knew my brother's height better than a random if you knew the height of a completely random unrelated person you're going to have trouble guessing my height from that information right but if you know the height of my brother you have more chance of guessing how tall i am and that's exactly what this covariance matrix is doing it's modeling that effect between all individuals and then it gets fitted in the model as a random effect um, so it becomes what's called a mixed linear model and it accounts for that covariance. So it should be fine. Um, I, in my population of eucalyptus, I actually had more, far more kinship than what you're mentioning because I had a, we had a limited number of mother trees that were sampled. We had seed sampled from them. They had random fathers with the seed, but about 40 mother trees. So we had 12 half siblings from 40 families. That's what formed up the population of 480. Within each of those 40 families, these 12 half sibs are quite related to each other. They have the same mother. So I had to account for that really, really well with 
this kinship matrix. The limitation of this means that if you have a phenotype that varies in line with that kinship, something like an adaptive trait that population differences reflect the differences in the phenotype, then by accounting for the kinship, you're going to remove the signal that you're looking for altogether and you won't find associations. So it's a double-edged sword. It needs to be done to prevent false positives, but can also prevent you from finding true positives. Okay. Um, Kent Wilcox asks, how many genomes do you need to sequence in order to generate a database of 1 million common SNPs? Depends on the species entirely. Some species are quite interbred. So if you were working with a domesticated species that have had thousands of years of, um, of breeding and inbreeding, you find that genetic diversity is quite low. There might only be one, if you took their genome, there might only be one of these SNP sites every 10 kilobases, every 10,000 base pairs. In an undomesticated species like eucalyptus that I was working with, I found a SNP every 10 or so bases. There's huge genetic diversity. So it's a how long is a piece of string question. You have to understand first the genetic diversity in the species you're working with to be able to estimate that. And, and so a sort of similar question, Matthew Marr asks, how much discernible population substructure is there among American chestnuts? And where would individuals be selected for GWAS? I unfortunately can't answer that question because I don't know much about chestnut genetics. Is, could someone else here potentially answer that? I don't think we know yet, Steve. What, what do you think? I, I don't think we know yet, but I will tell you. I mean, what, what, why don't you spend a, a few seconds telling about our, our, our landscape, uh, our population studies? Which is, sure. Which so we'll get at some of that. Right, right. So we, we are endeavoring to know that. How, how diverse is the population? Um, we have studies up until now, studies that were done on neutron markers, studies that have been done on mitochondrial DNA and other things have shown that we have definitive different populations of chestnuts, especially in the southern parts of the region. So Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, all these areas that would have been the glacial refugia in the southern Appalachians hugely diverse, really different, and not even like a single population, like maybe even four or five different population oh, subsets. Yeah. As you go north, especially Virginia, Pennsylvania, and then even, you know, less diverse as you get up into New England, there's much less diversity based on those studies. Have, have, have they used, say, microsatellites or something to study the Yes, diversity. They, they have. And, and, and all those all those patterns are relatively the same. They see either a south to north, um, you know, population uh, a diversity difference or even a west to east as well. I will say most of those studies are, were done on very small populations, 20 trees, 40 trees and tended to be skewed to the south. So I think that there's still room for looking for diversity in the Northern areas. I do think that they're correct. I do think that no matter how you slice this, we're gonna find more diversity in the South regardless. Um, and so uh, the landscape genomics project that Steve mentioned, uh, we've sampled about 300 trees from across the range. Uh, what we did was we used um, the USDA, or sorry, the, the NRCS EPA's landscape uh, region uh, four regional or level four regional maps. Okay, they've got the thing broken down into different ecotypes. So we figured that that's probably the best way to decide where we should collect. And so we, we endeavored to collect a sample, at least one sample, if not more, from each of these ecotypes, ecoregions. Uh, they've been sent to Virginia Tech for, for, for sequencing and, and then uh, probably two or three years from now, <laughs> we'll, after all the, the bioinformatics are, are run and everything, we'll, we'll, we'll know what the population structure is. Like oh, little... Hopefully, if it's been sent for sequencing, the, the bioinformatics pipelines are now you know, pretty efficient. GWAS is, has been around for 12 plus years, and the software is very good these days. There are experts out there. I mean, I'm fairly expert. There are people more expert than me who will run the um, run things through a pipeline. We, we've just done this in Poplar um, for our GWAS population at ORNL. We have about 1,500 uh, Poplar genotypes um, sampled all up the native range of Poplar on the west coast um, from California all the way up through British Columbia. Um, 
And, and yes, yeah, so they've all been sequenced. We could sequence those at JGI and called the SNPs in them. We found about 10 million useful SNPs and are running GWAS. So it, it's, it can be done fairly efficiently. It should not be two to three years. It was two to three years for me because I was a PhD student okay. doing everything on my own. Well, most things on my own and figuring out GWAS as I went. Um, but someone who's done this regularly can do this in months. Okay. Well, well we, we've got a grad student working on it sort of as a, he's a doctoral student. And I think part of this is his dissertation and, and thesis work. So it might, it might be somewhere between a few months and a few years, but well, regardless. If, if they need some kind of collaboration and need some assistance, well, that's where ORNL is always happy to, Excellent. Know, to chime in on these things. Um, just, they'll just put it out. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, we got a couple more questions. A technical question from anonymous attendee. How do you infer the other allele from the single reference comparison? For example, your reference was A, but the others could be C, G, T. Right, so here. In, um, the others, oh, so here where, where, where I inferred A slash G. Um, well, because what you see in your alignment, in, this is obviously a cartoon, what you really see, these reads are strings of characters, A, C's, G's, and T's. These, each of these blue lines is typically about 150 letters long of A, C's, G's, and T's. And what those A, C's, G's, and T's will all be matching the reference genome except for this spot. And so what you have is not a black dot. You have, in, in my little example, these would be G's. Now, somewhere else in the genome where you find a, if you found another SNP, well, the difference might not be a G, it might be a T. Um, so it's really what, what you see or what the software sees is different, is, is not an A, whatever is not an A. And it'll typically be one alternate allele. But sometimes at a site, when you measure things in a big population, you get more than one possible alternate allele. Some individuals might turn out to be A slash T here. Um, that might be rare, it just means that a mutation has occurred more than once at this spot in your population, or it could be an error. Um, yeah. That's the fun and games of bioinformatics right there. Yeah. yeah. I hope um, that, does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, Carl and Wendy Good, uh, they ask, infections require passage through a cell surface. Would it be worthwhile to focus on genes that affect the chemicals on the cell surface uh, for example, SARS-CoV-2 uses surface antigens to gain entry to the cell. When you say to focus, are you, do you mean, uh, are we able to bounce questions back to the uh, person asking the question? Yeah, I mean, they can always type it in. Yeah. Okay, so obviously being a genome-wide association, you're focusing on everything. That's the point, rather than focusing on a few candidate genes, which were the earlier ways of doing this type of type of functional of discovery genetics was when before before we could sequence things genome wide for an efficient price, we'd have to pick certain candidate genes, things that we could guess are likely to have an effect on our trait. And so that meant, oh look, here's 10 genes that we think are important. Let's sequence those because we can afford to sequence just those. We've moved away from candidate gene sequencing to genome-wide because we can afford it now. It's, it's become cheap. I think the answer I'd give is you still wanna go genome-wide, but when it comes down to looking at what you get from your GWAS and you got your candidate genes like, um, like these, you often get a lot of candidate genes, often too many to go and experimentally try and validate. So, the multiomic side of things, what you might want to do then is prioritize things that you have some a priori knowledge on, like, like what was described by the person asking the question with SARS-CoV and look at the multiomics context. So, so yeah, it, it pays to have some, some other knowledge of the system you're looking at to help prioritize genes for, okay. for downstream validation. 
Well, and I think this flows right into the last question that we'll take, and that's that's from Doug McCain. He says, since genomics on the American chestnut shows resistance is likely to be on multiple chromosomes and as many as a dozen genes or more or maybe less, but a lot, um, won't this make it hard to have GWAS be applicable? No, this is this tells you why GWAS is applicable. This is, you, you apply GWAS to all the chromosomes, you find all the locations that statistically associate with resistance, you rank them by p-value. You take, you look for the genes in close proximity to those SNPs or that the SNP is already sitting in. You can do some downstream clever stuff about whether that SNP seems to have an effect. Is it sitting in the third code, first and second code on positions of an amino acid? Or you can estimate the, whether that SNP has an effect or not on a protein. You you help prioritize your gene candidates. You use multiomics to find other lines of evidence to support those candidates. You rank them. You try and validate using CRISPR or using um, other methods like expression in E. coli, that kind of thing. So, yeah, the, the more complex a trait is, the more spread it is across the genome, the more applicable genome-wide association studies become. Excellent. Well, I, I love that as a way to, to end our, um, our chat about its application for Chestnut. There's a lot of a lot more to explore here for sure. Um, well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. Um, for those of you, um, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have Dr. Scott Merkel from UGA. He's going to talk to us about cloning and uh, uh, other sort of vegetative uh, uh, reproduction, especially for Chestnut. He's done a lot of tissue culture and cryopreservation work. So tune in for that. Uh, December 11th, we're going to have a town hall um, where you're going to have a lot of TACF staff and you can just ask whatever you want. It's going to be a total free for all. So I hope you guys will join us. That's the, those are the two final chestnut chats we have for the year. On the 13th, November 13th is Scott Merkel. And then December 11th will be our town hall chestnut chat. So uh, any last thoughts, David? I just want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, very good questions. People really know their stuff, it seems. And um, and yeah, um, it would be great to collaborate in some way on, on this problem. Wonderful. Well, we will, look, we will look forward to working with you in the future. Steve, thanks for hanging out with us. Dave, thank right. you. Well, I want to say personally again, thank, thank you very much. This has been very informative for me. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. See ya. Okay. Bye-bye.